It's noon. Let's get started. So let's stretch a little bit. I actually feel like this is a very important part of getting into this kind of exercise is to just get our brains kind of connected to what we're doing. And so the best way to do that is just to kind of ask what could be simple questions, but that can go a lot of wonderful directions. So what we're doing right now is just stretching, right? You can't be wrong. You're not going to say something wrong. And then remember that one of the things I feel it's my job to do is not to challenge you as though you're wrong, but to always push Because I've noticed that for most of us, sometimes it takes three or four times to get at something before we're like, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. Do you know what I mean? So my job, and this is actually, it's a method that's kind of rooted in Western philosophy that goes back, you know, about 2,300 years. It's the Socratic method. And that is that every answer is met with a question. And what it does is just pushes us. So let's start with ones now. Because now it's noon. You notice how I did that? I burn all that time until it's noon. Then we get started. All right, it's noon. What is faith? Because we're going to talk about, we have actually been talking about faith quite a bit. And now we're going to get into it deep. And we need to have some sort of working definition. So let's just think out loud. You can't be wrong. I will probably push. But that's not to challenge you. It's just to get deeper. What's faith? It's a relationship with God. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. What else would you say? What's faith? Please. It's just a belief in something. Faith is a belief in something. So you can have like faith in your government or faith in your football team or whatever, right? There you go. Hey, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting as much as people are not happy with the state of government right now. It is amazing, to be honest with you, though. Um, Nope. What was I doing? Oh, my gosh. I about got into politics. I avoided that one, but just barely. But I would like to talk with you about that sometime. Yeah, so you can have faith in lots of things. Awesome. What else is faith? When we're thinking about our faith, the the faith that we have, our religious faith. Can I just, oh, please, please. Oh, so now we're actually talking about a belief in something that we're not necessarily going to see. So if I say I'm standing here right now, you don't have to take that on faith. But if I say God is present with us right now, now we're talking about something that I cannot prove and I cannot validate. Interesting. I love all this. That's from Hebrews. What a great definition of faith, right? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. All right, this is awesome. Anybody else? Please. Faith is, I believe that I'm saved. So faith can be something very specific, too. And, and what he is saying is faith is believing that I'm saved. This is fantastic. Can I ask, can I just push a little bit more? Just for the fun of it. Who possesses faith? Like, whose is it? You have faith. Here's the thing. Every single one of you in this room, I'm looking at right now, and I say, you have an appropriate and beautiful faith in God. So this is the question. Who does that belong to? This is now, it starts to get a little bit more kind of slippery. Go ahead. The recipient of whatever you're believing. So you have received this. Awesome. If I've received it, whose is it? It can be the giver, can be the recipient. Have you ever heard of people who say, you know, I wish I had more faith? So in some ways, if you start to think about in the vernacular, I think it would be fair to say that when we talk about faith, we often talk about faith as though it is, it is, it is a thing. And it's a possession. There's nothing wrong with any of this. Right, And as things go and as possessions go, sometimes you have more of it, sometimes you have less of it. And so does that work with faith? P- keep going, please. What about the faith that Christ talked about, as small as a mustard seed? Mm-hmm. He's, he's asking the question. I'm going to repeat them so that it's on the recording. What about things like faith 
the size of a mustard seed. What, what would you like to say about that? Well, do any of us have it? Do any of us have it? They said you can move mountains with it. Yeah? I can't move any mountains. I can't, I can't even move my wife. <laughs> nope. I'm not repeating it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But here's what he said. He goes, okay, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move a mountain. But he's tried to move mountains, and he can't do it. This is awesome. This is all awesome. All right. Can we do something before then? Because what we have been talking up until this point in our conversation has been the relationship that we have with God in which a righteousness comes from outside of us somewhere. Like if righteousness exists, it's something that comes from the outside of us. In the same way that, remember, Luther chose Plato over Aristotle. Some other time, if you want us to go deep, deep, deep into that, I would love nothing more than that conversation. But this is more than just Luther kind of having an idea about God. Luther sees things through a kind of lens that would be very familiar with people who understand the Western philosophical tradition. And that is, Luther understands that there are things, there are forces that exist that are beyond our comprehension, that are beyond even our own access. And of course, this is what Plato believed. Like, he, you know, the idea, if you remember your Plato, like there's the immutable world of the forms. Like whenever you think about what a chair is, we all can agree that we know what a chair is. But if I, if I take that chair over there and I sit it right here in front of you and I say, is this what a chair is? You'll say, yes, that's what a chair is. Then I say, but what if I take one of the feet away? Is this still a chair? Well, kind of. Does this look like the chairs you have at home? Well, not exactly. But they're all chairs, right? And so there's this idea that somewhere, I'm simplifying, out in the ether somewhere there's a form, there's a perfect conception of chair. And then in the material world, the best we can do is get close to it. So, for instance, if you're frustrated with your government right now, ask yourself this question. Is there such thing as a perfect government? There might be a perfect conception of a government, but if it's going to exist in the material world, it's going to have to fall apart a little bit. So Plato isn't just kind of reading the Bible and, I mean, excuse me, Luther, reading the Bible and just kind of making stuff up as he goes along. Luther is, going to, Luther is going to place himself within the tradition of Western philosophy of Plato. And that is there are things that exist outside of us that we don't necessarily have access to, but they still exist. That's a very simplistic way of talking about this. All right. Let me stop. Any thoughts or questions that you all have? So righteousness, remember, is of two kinds. There's just like sin is of two kinds. And the first is the righteousness that comes from outside of us that we have no control over. Just like the sin, the original sin that's handed down to us generation after generation, that brokenness that we experience, that was not your doing. You had nothing to do with it. It comes from the outside of you. And so God responds by coming from the outside with righteousness. That is, is, is the doma domain of faith. So let's do something really quick. I would love if you had that Bible verse, if you have it, that is from Romans chapter 3. Can we look through this? I got it right here. Thank you, though, so much for asking. All right, so Romans chapter 3, for those of you who are kind of in the know within Lutheranism, this along with some stuff out of the book of Galatians, is where kind of the idea of sort of the Reformation Protestant breakthrough comes in. That God's grace and faith is given to us as a gift without any works of our own. Okay? Now we're going to talk about faith in here for a minute. So let's do. I just want to get into the text. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God is disclosed. Another way of saying that, the righteousness of God is, is disclosed to you outside of the law. Ten commandments. You hear what he's saying? Paul, this is Paul. It's not the ten commandments where you will find the righteousness of God. It is attested by the law and the prophets. Now, this is the verse. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We're going to take some time on this. We're going to take some time on this. Faith in Jesus Christ. 
can we just, maybe this is going to go nowhere. But what does faith look like in, in, this, in this context? If I have faith in Jesus, where, do, where does the faith come from? I have faith in Jesus. Who does the faith belong to? It came from the giver. Hopefully it came from the giver. But in this sentence, I am the subject. I have faith in Jesus. Jesus is the object. Is that right? Is that okay gram grammatically? I got to really be careful when I get into math and I get into grammar. But I think that's right. If I am the subject, who does the faith belong to? Me. So this text, and many people, fair enough, can read this and say, so faith must be my possession. Something I have. I mean, something I can lose. But faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Here's something we need to do just really quickly before we go back to Luther. We're going to do a linguistic analysis here. If you notice in that copy, right after Jesus Christ, there's a little itty-bitty letter. You see that? Most of you know all about this, but if you're kind of new to the Bible, let's just have this conversation. That is an indicating, like a footnote, that there's more information for you somewhere. So if you have Bibles that do this, they're giving you more information. Now, you see underneath in that text, that line that separates one bit of text from another bit of text? That's all commentary. Ignore it completely. That little K is not telling you to go to the commentary. Instead, you'll notice that it's right at the end of the biblical text. I'm just going to point here. It's not going to be on the camera. I'm sorry. But do you see right there where it might be able to tell you what that K is all about? So why is that K right after the words, Jesus Christ? What's it indicating to you? There's a different translation. That there are multiple ways of translating this. What are, what's another way of translating this text? Faith of. of Jesus. Okay? That's, those, are, those are two very, very, very different ways of talking about faith. In one case, it's if you have faith in Jesus. And now let me tell you this. I, I spent a lot of time this week, more time than you probably should know, because I wasn't doing other things, making certain that I'm right about this. But the best translation is faith of Jesus. This is a genitive. And in the book of, uh, of Romans, every time this kind of genitive form comes up, it's always translated of. The only time it ever says in is when in Greek they add the preposition en. Okay? So in this text, my understanding of the Greek, which is not insignificant, is that the translation of this text is the righteousness of God through faith of through the faith of Jesus for all who believe. How does that change an understanding that one might have of faith? Who does it belong to? It belongs to Jesus. This is, this is going to be important for understanding the nuances that Luther is going to now put into this conversation. Please. So, <clears throat> you had just said that in other spots in here, they always say of. Yep. They obviously took the time to say in yes. Jesus Christ. So yes. There's a specific mm -hmm. reason why they did that. I agree with you. Why? Why do you suppose they would translate this, the faith in Jesus, instead of faith of Jesus? Because of a requirement. Yeah. There must be a theology at stake there that's important, that suggests, yeah, that suggests somehow, and by the way, this is still an open debate among Lutherans, not Lutherans, among Christians. And that is the question of, so what's my role in all of this? What role do I play, right? Is it my faith and I can do something with it, or is it God's faith? Anyway, we'll get to it. Anybody else have any thoughts about this, please? Just a historical question. Luther was reading this in Greek. He, he would have been reading this in Greek. The German. Yes. So he would have read it in Greek, so he would have been interpreting this. Yes. His way. Yep, yep. And we don't really know, but. Right. Yes, and that would be an interesting thing to see with somehow in the Latin, it was they used the preposition N and then it just kind of gets, 
But actually, I think that it's deeper than that. Because ultimately, you're going to have to start making some decisions about what you believe about God. And about what you believe about yourself. Whose faith are we talking about? Is it yours? Or is it God's faith? So Luther, remember, says that whatever you're getting, it's coming from the outside. And so, I think Luther's assumption is that faith belongs to God and is given to you. Because he just read the Bible. Third article of the creed, those of you who took confirmation, if you took confirmation, you remember what it said? About, it said, I, don't, I believe that I cannot, through my own power, come to confess that Jesus is Lord. But Paul says that too. So if I'm confessing that Jesus is Lord, by whose power am I doing that? It's God's power. So now what role do I play? None. So this is where, so the first massive conflict that Luther had with scholars was, and it was the greatest scholar of his time named Erasmus. Erasmus also wanted there to be reforms in the church. Luther didn't reform the church. He destroyed it and built another one. Luther was a revolutionary. He was not a reformer by any stretch of the imagination, but we call it Reformation whatever. Now, a reformer would have been a person like Erasmus who said, hey, we got to kind of clean up our act a little bit. Right? Luther said, we're going to tear all this down. But what Erasmus says is, here's the deal. We need to change. The papacy is corrupted. You know, priests are corrupted oftentimes. We need to change our practices, but we're going to keep our theology. And Luther comes along and says, hey, listen, we don't even need that institution the way it exists right now. And by the way, God just gives you faith, and you just trust that. And so, you know, all this happens. And here's what Erasmus said. If you take away from people the sense of an obligation that they owe to God, then what's to keep them from being bad? If you take away from people the idea that they have to follow the Ten Commandments in order to be saved, then what if they just abandon the Ten Commandments and they're just going to be bad? You ever heard that idea? If you take away rules, what's just to keep people from being terrible? And so this was the, uh, this was the accusation, um, the massive accusation made by those who... Uh, supported the Roman tradition of the church against Luther. If you tell everyone that they're priests, if you tell everyone that God just gives them faith and just gives them grace and that they don't have to do anything, then people will be bad. So it's, it's in giving people responsibilities and obligations and telling them that they can lose things that that's what it is that makes people good. That's all going to be completely challenged in this text. But let's just make sure we understand the argument. Do you get it? If, if, if I come every Sunday and say, no matter what anyone says, God loves you. Every single Sunday, no matter what anyone says, God loves you. At some point, would that cause you to maybe think, well, no matter what, I, I'm just, I could start stealing. Would you do that? That's what Luther said. Why, do, why does somebody need to be compelled to be good. But this is the major argument. And so this is where it's going to kind of freak some people out. For Erasmus, Erasmus believed that people had free will. I decide if I'm good. I decide if I'm bad. And if I don't follow God's rules, that's my decision, and I go to hell. Luther comes along and says, you don't have any role in this. You don't have anything to say about it. God can save whoever God wants, even you. And so you might end up being the worst person on earth, and yet if God wills it and you are saved, then you are saved despite anything that you do. I've never taught a confirmation class where we talked about grace, where somebody didn't finally raise their hand, because in about seventh grade, they haven't had their ideas beaten out of them yet. They're coming close. They're going to be eighth graders soon, and now they're concerned about whether or not they're going to be judged by their peers. So now they, but by seventh grade, they still will ask those questions, and they'll say, what about Hitler? What about Hitler? Well, what do you think? There's an approach that says, if God wills, he's saved. It's, that's an ugly idea, isn't it? It's a despicable idea. And it's where, in many ways, Luther's massive first kind of 
uh, conflicts arose. It really wasn't so much over the power of the papacy. It was the idea of whether or not a person could, outside of the church, come to know God. This is a great conversation for us to have another time, right? So let's get into this for a moment. As we consider this alien righteousness, remember it's a righteousness that comes from outside of us. And it deals with the sin that we were all born into that had nothing to do with you. You are not responsible for the fact that you are born into a life that, that is going to decay. It is not your, it's not your fault that there is animosity between, say, human beings and the rest of the created order. You participated in it, but it's not your fault. So the first kind of righteousness comes from outside of us. Where God just simply loves you, makes you righteous, and gives you faith. So, the relationship that we have with God, that is faith. Let me stop there, because there's a thousand more ways of coming at it, but let me just see where you're at. Are we good with this? Okay. Let's keep reading. As long as we're together. All right, we are going to go to, let's go on page 120 on the right-hand column, and it starts one, two, three, four lines down, and it says, it does not say in my, you see that? Let's read this. Luther says, the psalmist does not say in my But in thy righteousness, that is the righteousness of Christ, my God, becomes ours through faith by the grace and mercy of God. The Psalter, faith, is called the work of the Lord. Confession, the power of God, mercy, truth, righteous, all of these are names for faith in Christ, rather for the righteousness which is in Christ. Who does faith belong to? God. Does it belong, according to Luther, to people? No. Which means I am in no position to determine the conditions of your faith. Would that make sense? Remember all this time that Jesus is saying, don't judge people? That's why. What, who am I? What role can I possibly pay in determining, for instance, your relationship with God when that is all something that God does despite me? What do you think? Great, we're all on the same page. This is going to make things so much easier, right? Okay, so let's go down to that next paragraph. Therefore, this alien righteousness. Therefore, this alien righteousness is installed in us without our works by grace alone. While the Father, to be sure, inwardly draws us to Christ, it is set opposite original sin, likewise alien, which we acquire without our works by birth alone. Christ daily drives out the old Adam more and more in accordance with the extent to which faith and the knowledge of Christ grow. Alien righteousness is not instilled all at once, but it begins, makes progress, and is finally perfected at the end through death. So this is Luther's conception. Faith and righteousness God gives to you is not yours. I don't think, I don't know of North Americans that believe that at all. It's, it's just, it, it kind of, I think in some ways it pushes against kind of our kind of ideological understandings of who we are, right? And by the way, I'm all for this. But the idea that we are strong and that we can, uh, there's a destiny that we get to participate in, and we can reject the destiny, or we can just accept it, but this is who we are, and, you know, and all the things we do are always good, and any number of those sorts of ideas are very conscious, are very part of our consciousness. And so it's very difficult to imagine that you would say about somebody, their value has nothing to do with what they do. Because I don't think that's what we believe as a culture. Our, what we believe as a culture, I think, is your value is based upon not only what you do, but what you can do for me. And so understand, I mean, I think you understand, let me say it like this, how hard it could be to say, if I despise this person, God still loves them. 
Okay? Did you notice what Luther said? It's instilled in us, but not all at once. It begins, makes progress, is finally perfected at the end through death. So, God gives us this righteousness. God gives me faith, and God gives me righteousness. But you know what? When Roxy, my dog, gets into food that I have left within Roxy's kind of grasp, it's my fault, right? And then I forget to feed Roxy in the morning. I come home, and Roxy has taken all the King's Hawaiian buns and and, and scattered them all over the ground, and I flip out. Am I righteous? No, I don't think I am. But God says I'm righteous, and so am I righteous or not? Am I still a sinner? Because remember what Luther said. Well, once, you know, once God instills God's righteousness with you and gives you faith, sin doesn't exist. Here's how Luther manages this. Have you ever heard this term before? Saint and sinner. So here's how Luther understands it. Yes, we are baptized. So yes, the consequence of original sin is dealt with. We have faith in God. But what remains to be seen is what we are going to do with it. Does that make sense? So what we do with our faith, this Luther calls love. So we're going to make a distinction now between faith and love. All right, should we go on? Faith is something that God gives to us. Love is what we do with it. All right, can we get going? 121, basically, essentially. It's on the one, it's on the page that says 120. No, 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 it's not 121. Still 120, right-hand column, the very last paragraph. Somebody want to, you know, I'll read it just so that people online can get it. So there's a second kind of righteousness. There's two kinds of righteousness. The second kind of righteousness is our proper righteousness. Not because we do it alone, but because we work with the first and the Alien righteousness. I know, I know. Two more seconds, we'll get some. That is, in a manner of life spent profitably in good works. When I became a Lutheran, it was an accident. I really was just trying to impress a a girlfriend, and more than that, her parents, right? And so I couldn't have cared less about any of this stuff. And... um, but I first became a, uh, a Lutheran. It was always important, as people were teaching me about Lutheranism, to make certain that I never fell into something called works righteousness. Have any of you ever heard this term before? Works righteousness, the most unhelpful combination of words I have ever encountered in my life. But let's think for a moment. Those of you who know what works righteousness is or have heard it, tell me what you have heard when people talk about well you can't be works righteous what does that tend to mean can't be wrong what are people talking about good works won't get you to heaven good works will not get you to heaven right that's works righteousness so do we do good works so we do works right it's just we don't trust works that's it. But for many people, I, I can kind of remember this notion that, oh, no, 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 nothing you do, nothing you do is of any value, right? The best we can do is just try our absolute best not to be a further annoyance to the God who loved me so much that God would save me. So I'm going to do good works and stuff like that, but ultimately it's not you and it's not pleasing to God and it can't have anything to do with your salvation. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what Luther's saying. I think what Luther's saying is that works come from the faith that God gives us, but they are essential. Does that make any sense? Should we talk about what I mean by works? Or what do you think? Yeah. Well, we kind of talked about this in our Bible study the other week. Mm -hmm. To summarize, the stronger you are in faith, the more good works you will do naturally. You just will do things because of your, your strength. Yes. You're not doing good works to, as I've been accused of in my Bible study, for an applause meter or a check the box type, type deal. That's, uh-huh. that, we separated those. So the stronger you are in faith, 
the stronger the Holy Spirit is in you and the more good works you will do. So I, I, I think all that's awesome. And I'm going to push a little bit too. So just to make sure. So he said, the stronger you are in your faith, the more that will impact your works. And then you will do more good works. Is it okay if we push that just a little bit? Just for the fun of it. If the idea that we can become stronger in our faith has an assumption built into it. What's the assumption? Us, for sure. That you don't have as much. That there's a, that, so that there's like, you know, I've got three quarters of a gallon of faith today. But, you know, I could use a gallon. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be, right? right? So in some ways, we're going to have to reconcile ourselves to the idea that Luther doesn't believe that faith comes at you in an insufficient amount. So if God has given you faith, you just have it. But sometimes we don't feel it, do we? Sometimes, so the question is, why is it that I feel like I don't have faith? But if God has given you the Holy Spirit in baptism, which God certainly did, you have all of the faith of God. And so, in a way, can anyone ever not have enough faith? By the way, this this stuff takes years. And we're not going to solve this, right? But let's just ask that question. Is it possible to not have sufficient amount of faith? I think it's possible to not realize you have enough faith. Great. It's possible to not realize it. And by the way, Luther's not Jesus, so you can disagree with him. I'm just going to push. But it's possible to maybe not live or realize you have faith. I, I agree with that completely. And yep. also talked about that um, Luther said... That he doesn't give you this all at once, right? That's right? The righteousness is not instilled all at once. That describe that. So that's why I that's why I can still be uh, justified and saved by grace through faith, and sometimes still yell at Roxy when I've just had a bad day, because I'm not perfect, and so I may have the faith, the righteousness I also have, but we're working on it. I don't know, I kind of feel like that's a Weasley way out personally. Luther took it because it leaves us, conf- yeah. Should we keep going? Are we uh, <clears throat> born with God's faith or receive it at baptism? Oh, right on. Okay. He asked, are we born with faith or do we receive it at baptism? So let's just kind of, in, let's just kind of go over what we talked about and just kind of come up with a conclusion. So when do you receive faith? your baptism. And in faith, at your baptism, God gives you all of God's righteousness, the power, remember that, that happy exchange. So Luther would claim that that comes at baptism. But Christians still disagree with this. What do you think? No. Some... What about a person that has not been baptized? Can I tell you, Luther actually wrote about this. And he, 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 was, he wrote specifically to mothers who have experienced um, miscarriages or stillbirths. And he says, listen, God is God, and God is good, and God promises to love us, so you can always trust the grace of God. You can always trust the grace of God. So you might not have gone through a baptism, but you can trust that God is good. And that God will never, ever condemn somebody just to do it. That was his, that was, that was an approach that he took to that. However, let me not pretend that Luther wouldn't have thought, if you're 32 years old and you have avoided baptism, I'm sure as far as Luther was concerned, you're going to burn in hell. I mean, he's still medieval, as he's a modern as well. But I, drawing on what Luther kind of generally tends to say, wonders whether or not Nope, I'm going to leave it there. Go ahead, please. Well, I keep hearing this conflict in terminology about uh, faith and righteousness, whether or not it's all given to us or whether it's parceled out. Yes. Yeah. The, the way I, I look at it, rightly or wrongly, is that, okay, if Luther's right and it's given all to us, you know, otherwise we've got God kind of withholding it and just giving it to us PCP. Right. Because we're still touched by the reality of sin. The sanctifying process. But it's like, to me, it's like anything else. If you're given a gift, that doesn't mean you're going to use it. 
That's true. So with this, uh, just what I make sure for the, for the film, he says, just because you're given a gift doesn't mean you're going to use it. Great. So if God gives me faith and I don't use my faith, what happens to the faith? It diminishes. Whatever God says. Because it's God's. If it's mine, that's another story. But if it belongs to God, God can do whatever God wishes with that. And if I could push one step further, one step further, it would take, all of us could do this, within five minutes of speaking to a person, doesn't matter who they are, you can find their unrighteousness. Doesn't matter who you are. Five minutes it would take. I bet I could do it in two, because I'm a professional. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, I hear what you're saying. I would say if that's the case, though, if we choose, if you say, well, God gave me faith and I'm going to ignore it, I would have to say that's true of every single person in this room. I could probably find the place where you have ignored the gift that God gave you. And let me do it this way. Not in because you haven't done nice things. Here, how about this one? How about love yourself? How about love yourself the way God loves you? Go do that. And if you can't do it, does that mean that somehow there's something wrong with your faith? Because you would basically be saying, well, I can't love myself, God, because I just can't. Well, God would say, but I created you in my image, and I love you. I redeemed you, and you say, yeah, God, I understand, but I just don't buy it. So let me stop there. Do you want to come back? Is, is that okay? Is that okay? Go ahead. Well, I'm stepping us back a minute. Good, good. Yes. I mean, Joyce always had this little. So I've been at this a long time. Uh huh. To make all these things work together. <laughs> yes, yes. So I, that's stirring through my head, so I'm throwing it out there. And that was a huge issue. That was a massive issue because that all started about the time Luther decided that everyone was a priest. And then some people said, well, you know what? I am a priest. And come to think of it, when I read this book, I don't see anything about baptizing little kids. So I'm not going to do it. And as a matter of fact, we can't do it, right? I will, pr I will promise you, Luther had more problems with that than he did with any pope. And so it's, a confus it's confusing. But here is what I would think that Luther would come at that. I think when Luther would come out with it, and what she said was, and she was, she was brought up Baptist, beautiful tradition, love my Baptist friends, right? And that in ba the Baptist tradition, they don't baptize till you're 13, Zero problem with that. It's great and wonderful. But what Luther would say is, if God promises to meet you at baptism, if faith is something that belongs to God and doesn't have anything to do with you, if you don't consent to it or anything else, it's just a gift, why in the world would you withhold it from someone? And this is the other question that Luther would want to ask. What is it about a 13-year-old or a 30-year-old? This is not an attack. But what is it about a 13-year-old that that person now all of a sudden is able to understand the mind and the will of God? What about a 50-year-old? What about a 70-year-old? Does anybody able to approach God with wisdom to know the mind of God? And Luther would say, no. So whether you are five months old or 50 years old, we're all in the same boat. So God has to do the work. That would be, I think, Luther's answer to that question. And um, now, what do you think? Well, I, I hadn't really thought about it a whole lot. Just yeah. Because the, the Baptists do a dedication yep. for children at that time. And then, and, it, and it's not 13, it's whenever you're called to go for it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so I don't know. When I look at talking about faith in the way that we're talking about it today, yeah. Like so, yeah, so this was hugely controversial, hugely controversial. And I would say that Luther had more conflict 
with other Protestants on these issues, on, on baptism and communion, than ever he had with the, Roman, with the Roman church. In fact, Luther, at one point, talking about communion, we'll get to that sometime too, he says, I would rather eat, you know, the body and blood with the papists than pretend with, uh, you know, with, with uh, the other Protestants, I'm using what he called them were um, shformer or radicals or whatever. And so in, some, in a lot of ways, we, we are probably closer to the Roman tradition than we are to other Protestants on that. Did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, to her point there or your point about yep. that, um, there's a, the legal concept of age of reason. Yep. seven-year-old child that got killed. Yep. And the parents were saying, thank God that the, that child accepted Christ just in time. You know, because they had gotten to the age of reason. That was the concept. Okay, so I don't forget that. What he said was, there was this image, and that was these parents had like a seventh grader or seven-year-old. And there was a car accident. So the seven-year-old is now in a fatal situation, and the parents say, thank God that this person accepted Jesus. All right, so let's think about that for a minute. Let's think about that for a minute. What understanding can a person bring to the question of knowledge of the will of God? Maybe that's, a, that's, a, that, maybe that's too, too different a way of saying it. In what way, if I'm broken... Right? I can't love myself. I can't love you as I ought to. In what way does my mind then able to comprehend the mysteries of God? Because it, you, and your answers are awesome. But that's going to tell you kind of where, where you sit. And I think what Luther would say is no one, no one through the use of human reason can know anything about God at all. It all has to be given. So for Luther, the idea of human reason playing any role in this is excluded. In fact, you know, Luther used to say things like, blind your reason, kill it, tear its eyes out. Throw dirt on its face, make it ugly. Do not believe that you can intuitively come to an understanding of the work of God. It's pretty heavy stuff. I'm going to come over here. Go ahead. Okay, so, so if I look at this biblically, Yep. Take the side of our Baptist friends and some of our yeah. Because um, biblically, they're going to say, okay, Philip and the eunuch, he taught them all about God. Ah, I understand. Why can't I not be baptized? Paul, the jailer, he taught them all about God. They said, ah, this is cool. Baptize me in my household. Right. Right? Yeah. That implies that they gained some level, maybe not all, but some level of understanding. Yeah. And that was, for some reason, a requirement for baptism. Okay. All right. So, let's go there. Let's, let's go there. There's more examples than that, but that's two. Okay. 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 Um, if you ask for baptism, are you already knowledgeable then of God? If I, if I can say, I want this baptism, I want what it has, am I already now kind of in that relationship of faith with God? I mean, why would I have asked for it? No, no, I'm just thinking out loud. What made me ask for it? When you're asking for a different level of relationship with God by saying, I want to be baptized. I think you're right. And if it's an action that you are asking for. So there's this, and we, we'll get to this. Yeah, so let me give you this. Now we're going to have to get into this moment of Plato and Aristotle, right? So here is the deal. When Luther comes into this conversation, up until that point, scholasticism and the kind of way in which theology happened was basically rooted in Aristotle. And that is, through my senses and the things that I observe, I can look around and I can draw conclusions about God's will, right? And so if I can draw conclusions about God's will, and if I can look around and I can draw an understanding from the things I see about the nature of God, 
This is why they would do things like have debates on how many angels can dance on the, ne- on the head of a needle. Okay? You're going to have to use human reason to understand things about the will and the mind of God. And although Aristotle certainly said, and Aquinas and others certainly said, there's only so much you can actually know, they did believe that through human reason you could draw conclusions about God. Luther said, not at all. Because Luther was platonic. So let me just kind of put it this way. This comes back, and then I promise we'll get to the text 121. This is what Luther said in the Heidelberg Disputation. I'm going to look at it like this. Imagine you go out to a mountain. You go to Colorado, and you're overwhelmed by the beauty of those mountains. And you say to yourself, God is here. I just feel it. There's just something about this. I, I want to write a poem. I want to write a song. I'm inspired by this, right? And then you see that eagle just kind of, and now we have eagles in Iowa too. I I pass them all the time on the way to Oxford, Iowa. But this is my eagle impression, right, like this. And that eagle is soaring through the sky. Oh, my goodness. That's my second poem. I have been so moved by this, and I feel the presence of God with me, right? You ever heard people talk like this? Nothing wrong with that kind of talk. Here's where Luther's going to come in. Luther's going to say, do you know what that eagle's doing right now? What is the eagle doing? Hunting. And what's that eagle going to do when it finds that rabbit or when it finds that whatever? It's going to go down and with its little knives in its feet is going to tread that thing alive and then feed it to her children. Do they call baby? I don't know. I mean, I don't mean to anthropomorphize, but you get it. Eat it, puke it into the children. The children then are going to excrete that. All right? So in that excrement, do you see God? And the answer, and the question is, why not? Why wouldn't you see God there? Here's what Luther says. You don't see God there because you're looking for God in the places where it makes sense to you that God would be. In the mountains, in the soaring eagle. But how about ripping that rabbit to shreds? How about the disgusting reality that in order for certain things to live, other things have to die? Is God there? Is God in the feces? Because you kind of have to have it all of that. Where do we find God? No, it's not in the feces. It's in the awesomeness. And I think Luther would say, maybe that's why we miss the presence of God among us. Because we're relying on, on a human reason, and we're missing the fact that God is present in places where we think God cannot be. Your suffering is a perfect example of that. The terrible things that have happened to you in your life, that somehow it's like, well, where is God in all of that? Well, I see no evidence of God here. Well, Luther would say, but you don't have to see evidence of God for God still to be there. Just like my kids don't have to, don't have to uh, believe that I love them when I tell them. But I do, and they can't change that. What do you think? So Luther believes you cannot draw conclusions about the mind and the will and the work of God by what you see because you'll draw the wrong conclusions. You'll look for the mountain, you'll look for the soaring eagle and miss God present in the feces. As disgusting as that is, I know that it is. So let's see what we can do. 121, 121. Okay, we're going to go right in the middle of that left-hand column. It said, this righteousness goes on. Do you see it? This righteousness goes on to complete the first, for it ever strives to do away with the old Adam, to destroy the body of sin. Therefore, it hates itself, hate that, and loves its neighbor. It does not seek its own good, but that of another. Let's go down. Let's go down. This righteousness, you see that paragraph? This righteousness follows the example of Christ in this respect and is transformed into his likeness. It is precisely this that Christ requires. You ready? Here it is. Just as he himself did all things for us, not seeking his own good, but ours only, and in this he was most obedient to God the Father, so he desires that we should also set the same example for our neighbors. So this is Luther saying, Here's how faith works. God gives you the faith because God is good. It is a gift, right? And through that faith, you receive the grace of God. You embrace the grace of God. Once you have done that, then you live that faith out through love. I think that's what you were saying. 
Once you have the faith, what you have with your relationship with your neighbors is love. Faith looks up. It looks towards God. Faith is something that kind of moves down towards us. Faith is a vertical. No, that's vertical, right? Yes. Love is ours. So the way that we utilize our righteousness is by caring for each other. And not just caring for each other, but caring for each other as Christ cared for us. This is where it's going to start getting crazy. How does Christ care for you? How does God show love for you in Christ Jesus? This one I do have the answer for. I just want to think out loud with it. Should I just tell you? The crucifixion. As far as Luther was concerned, everything in the Bible, you could do away with all of it. He wrote this in a brief introduction on what to look for and expect in the Gospels. And here's what he said. You could do away with everything in the Bible. All the, all the stories of the miracles of Jesus, the Ten Commandments, you can get rid of all those things and still have the Gospel. The Gospel is fully revealed in the passion and the crucifixion of Jesus. What? So this is what gets Luther into trouble and Lutherans into trouble. Our ethics are not based on the Ten Commandments. They're just not. Ethics for Lutherans is not based on, did I cheat today? Did I steal today? Did I lie today? It's deeper than that. Luther's ethics are rooted in the passion of Jesus. Well, let's think about why. What, did, what happened in the passion of Jesus? But we found God in the places where we don't think God can be. There's God in the excrement. There's God in the betrayal. Right? There's God in the betrayal of Jesus by the people that Jesus should have been able to love. Here's God in the unjust accusation made against Jesus. Here is God in the fact that Jesus can say nothing to defend himself. Here is God when the people then who he's supposed to be able to trust then abandon him again. Here is God being falsely accused. Here is God being mocked and humiliated. Here is God nailed to the cross and left for dead. That's a little much. How could that possibly be and set a standard for our ethics? All right, let's go up to the top of that 121. Okay. This is Christian ethics. See, it says, therefore, therefore, through the first righteousness arises the voice of the bridegroom. Remember that wedding? We exchange the rings. The one says, here's all that I am. Here's my sin, my brokenness, my death. And the other says, I'll take it. That's God. I'll take it. It's mine now. And that exchange, and now God says, here's my righteousness, my love, my eternal life. All right. So here it is. The voice of the bridegroom who says to the soul, I am yours. That's God saying, I'm yours. Through the second righteousness, the proper righteousness that we're now talking about, comes the voice of the bride who says, I am yours. That's our righteousness. When God says, here I am, all of this for you. I'll give you everything that's mine. My living is your living. My dying is your dying. Suffering, everything. I'm with you for everything. And it's mine. When we say, it's all mine, that is our response to God. So the only decision we make in many ways is not do we, are we in relationship with God, because you are. The question coming back to, I think, what you were talking about is, how are we going to live that out between other people? Now I've got free will. How am I going to love you? That's the only thing you have control over. Can I keep going? Okay. Then the marriage is consummated. It becomes strong and complete in accordance with the Song of Solomon. My beloved is mine. I am his. Then the soul no longer seeks to be righteous in and for itself. It has Christ as its righteousness and therefore seeks only the welfare of others. We can do an awful lot with this text, but that's enough for today. Did you hear what Luther said? So here's what love looks like. Love looks like well, you tell me. You tell me. We got five more minutes. What's love? Love, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. 
There you go. Oh, the two, what are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love your neighbor. Could we say that the love God part, that's faith. Love your neighbor, that's love. Could we do that? I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. We can do a lot of things, can't we? So love is yours. And the model that Luther is relying on is not the Ten Commandments. Oh, if we just do the Ten Commandments, then we get, you know, if we're just trying as hard as we can. The model is, what does Jesus do? Jesus comes into our lives and says, I'm yours, you're mine now. I go everywhere with you. And where are you going to go? To, the, to those shadowy places. There's a lot more feces in our lives than we are willing to admit. And Luther talked like that. And so what he said was, in order to love people, do what Jesus did for them. Take their burdens, make them yours. Isn't that what Jesus does on the cross, right? Jesus takes the sin of the world. All the burdens of the world are laid on his shoulders. Well, if that's what happens to Jesus, then that's what Christians do, supposedly, right? So Christians do for one another what God, through Christ, did for us. What does that mean? Well, Christ suffered in our place for us. Christ covers over our unrighteousness. Christ sees the shame and says, no more. Christ sees the sin and says, covered over. So the way that we live in love is that we do this for each other. If you have righteousness, this is what Luther said, it only exists for you to cover over the shame of your neighbor. Isn't that amazing? How about this? How about this? Remember the conversations we were having in this church right around 2009? And by say, uh, this church, I mean the ELCA. I don't know how that conversation happened in this congregation over the question of human sexuality. But it was so disgusting where I was. It was so despicable that as far as I was concerned, in 2009, I was done. But 2011, I like signed the paperwork. I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with this. Because it was so amazing for me to watch as people destroyed each other over some idea of their own righteousness. But it's like, we're Lutherans. And it was even more interesting to me is to read in the 1519 commentary that Luther writes on the book of Galatians. You know what he says? If you are pure, then that purity is to be used to cover over others. Now, I'm not here to talk about human sexuality as purity or impurity, but don't you think that the impulse of Christians would have been to say, hey, if there's something wrong with this, I'm going to use my righteousness and cover over it. But you know what happened at those meetings, at the Senate Assembly meetings? Moron after moron stood up at a microphone to explain how it is, right, that if you don't live a pure life, God is going to be so mad at you that you're going to burn forever in eternity. And if the church so much as shows even the slightest bit of compassion, then we're going to as well. And that God's going to destroy us all. You know one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life? And I've heard a lot of dumb things. The dumbest thing I think I've ever heard in my life was when they had the churchwide assembly up in Minnesota. And they voted at that point. Is that where they voted at the time to allow for same-sex marriages? Is that where that was, Pastor Jeff? There was something that happened in Minnesota, and like a lightning bolt hit the top of it. Do you remember that? Destroyed the, Destroyed the steeple. And what did people conclude? Whoa! <laughs> really? You think God is going to go out of God's way to send a lightning bolt to destroy a, ste a steeple? Why didn't God just send that lightning bolt into your car? I mean, really seriously, if that's how God operates, why isn't God doing that to you for all of the things that you have done? But the idea was, for many Christians, is let's lift these things up and condemn them. As opposed to saying, well, here's what Christ did on the cross. Christ took my whatever and said, it's all mine now. We're in this together, covered over everything that was mine, and gave me righteousness. And if that's what the church is supposed to do, then how do you ever get yourself into a situation where you're condemning people? Because I'll be honest with you, the meanest people I've ever met in my life all have one thing in common. They're all Christians. Every one of them. I happen to hang out with Christians quite a bit, so it's kind of unfair. But it's not as though our Christianity somehow makes us perfect. And so if we're Luther, it's like, yeah, I'm not surprised by the fact that we're not righteous. I'm not surprised at the fact that we're going to point out other people's sins and forget our own. I'm 
not going to, you know, let's not be surprised by that, but let's be disappointed by it. I mean, if God has done these things for us, then this is what we do for others. But to me, I love that because that's the root of our ethic. Our ethic is deeper than just be nice to somebody because being a thief is a terrible thing to be. How about saying, you know what, I'm going to love you because this is what Christ has done for me, and I'm going to do the same thing for you that Jesus did for me. I'm going to be the one that covers over your shame. So this is how Christians live in the world. Let me stop there. What do you think? I went, I, I went a little heavier than, there I, than I wished to. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the concept I'm talking about is agape love, where basically, you know, I do for others with no expectation of return or for me. There's nothing in it for me. <clears throat> he said, and he used the term agape, and I was kind of going through my brain trying to kind of make sure that I was kind of clear on definitions. But the idea of love is that it's what's in it for you, not for me. That makes sense. What's in it for God to love me? I can't see anything other than the pure beauty and love of the creator to the created. But other than that, I deserve none of it. This is why Lutherans talk like that. You don't deserve it, but that doesn't mean you're garbage. It just means that you're going to get it anyway. And then so what we do with that gift is we give it away to the world. All right, anybody have a... Pro Go ahead, what's that? Is it unconditional? I believe it is. What do you think? A lot of Christians will put all kinds of conditions on salvation. That's fair. If you want to do that, that's fine. But it's hard to do that and believe that we're going to supposed to love the world the way God loves us because there's no conditions there that I can see. Go ahead. I think we're talking about two different realms, too. We're I do. We're talking about the spiritual realm, but we're also talking about living in a functional society. Yes. So while <laughs> if, if you murder someone and I'm the judge, I can sentence you as long as you're alive. Yes. But I have no jurisdiction over your salvation. Right. How about this? Do you ha when God says you've got to love everybody, can you still believe that somebody is a snake in the grass and also believe that God loves them? I wonder sometimes, this is me thinking out loud, I wonder if Jesus, when Jesus says, do not judge other people, does Jesus mean I'm not supposed to be angry with other people? Does Jesus mean that I'm not supposed to set boundaries? Remember, Paul says, don't be angry with one another. But what Paul actually says is, be angry, but don't be the kind of angry where you consume. So we can be disappointed in each other, right? We can. And God can still intervene and still love. Is that going where you wanted to go? Salvation is not for us to dispense or to withhold. Yes. And, and so we can deal in the physical, earthly world, yeah. but not in the realm of the spiritual. Exactly. And for those of you who know Plato, that makes perfect sense. Pastor Jeff, what did you want to say? I think it's interesting how important language is. Yeah. And there's a distinction between justification and sanctification. Or to put it um, in, in oversimplistic, the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think we often get in trouble when we confuse the two. And so I'm just wondering, Pastor, um, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. So you quoted the small catechism, the third article, which is under the, the uh, person of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So at what point does the Holy Spirit have a different work than the work of Christ, which I think we would, we would probably as Lutherans would say, we're saved by grace, the faith of Christ, amen, amen, amen. And is there also then a unique work of the Holy Spirit? And does that come in this uh, conversation, or is that just a different conversation for a different treatise? No, I mean, so... In order, what Pastor Jeff was talking about, for those not be on thing, I think you probably heard him, but is there different working of the Spirit and is there different working of Christ? So, for instance, Christ provides the redemption, 
the Spirit provides the, uh, what we might call sanctification or the holiness. The Father creates, right? Is that kind of what you're talking about? And my answer to the, that would be that I think that Luther would have probably held with the idea that kind of separating the works of the persons would be a problem. And that there's this really interesting conception that I tend to think of when I think of, uh, of the workings of each one of the individual persons of the Trinity. And that is that the Spirit is the Father who's also the Son who's the Spirit. This is stuff I get from a guy named Jürgen Moltmann. But I kind of like this notion that there's an indwelling of all of the persons of the Trinity. If you have the Spirit, you have the Father. If you have the Father, you have the Son. Um, you'll have to help me, but I'm trying to think in my brain when Luther would separate those, and I just can't seem to find any. Can you help me with that? Separate in the catechism itself. Yeah. So as he explains the creed, yep. he certainly talks about the three persons. Yeah. And, you know, in the third article that you quoted, yep. I cannot by my own power fit, you know, reason, but the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens me and all Christians in the church. Yes. I'm going to be hesitant to, to separate them, so I'm going to say at this point, just kind of create a bit of a kind of an ambiguity in my understanding of this. But I would say that once you have the Spirit, you have the fullness of the Father. Once you have the Son, you have the fullness of the Spirit. Once you have the Son, you have the fullness of the Father. And the language that's used is, through the power of the Spirit, I come to faith in Jesus. Is that kind of what we're talking about? So I get where you're coming from. I just don't know that I can put my... I can't, I'm just kind of going through my uh, Rolodex here, and I don't have any place where I could confidently suggest that Luther completely differentiates the work. But it's probably there, and I'd have to think it through. So in Jesus, I will say this, though. In Jesus, we receive the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Remember what Luther said before, without Jesus, all you have is the relationship that you had with the Creator. And so remember when Luther says we're actually better off now because now we've got Christ and now we've got the Spirit. So what I can say without ambiguity is Luther believes that we don't come to faith in God on our own, but we can be like God by loving each other. Does that make any sense at all? Because what we're receiving is more than just kind of I believe we're receiving real power, as though Christ's power are mine. So through the Spirit, we get the power of Christ, and that's pretty amazing, which means we actually can, in our lives, live that out with one another. I don't know about language like sanctification. I have always had a hard time with that language, because, but I get it that right here it even suggests, ah, the righteousness finishes and is instilled finally by the time you die. I'm going to I'm gonna have to pray about that. I haven't figured that one out. All right, so this is where we've been, and this is where we're going, right? That for Luther, human beings are broken. Luther's anthropology is not optimistic. It's pessimistic. Human beings, it should never be a shock that somehow we choose sometimes things that will harm one another, that we aren't righteous in the way that God is righteous, and all of those things. It should never be a surprise to us that human beings sin, all right? So we're all sin, we're all broken, we all fall short of the glory of God. God makes a decision in Jesus to enter fully into what it means to be human. So that's what Jesus is. It's God's decision to be the one that creates the relationship, right? And in that relationship, God gives everything that is God's to you. That's faith. What we do with it is we reflect that love to the world. And so that's our role. We don't choose the faith, but I do believe that we choose the love. And that's where we can stop Today Is that okay with you? Because now, now I'm realizing I've got you 10 minutes over here. Um, but if any of you want to stick around afterwards and have this conversation, great. We'll do one more session in which I'll just make it that much more confusing and try and kind of plant the seed for the next class that we'll teach. Is that all right? All right, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the extra time. Yes. To you especially. Thanks, everybody.